Yeah, just um, just busy as usual. I think the big thing for me is that uh, I, I probably mentioned it before. I don't talk about it that much, um, but it is a huge. It has been a huge part of my life for the past three years. Is uh, I was doing a, a second um, grad degree in pharmaceutical chemistry, so basically like drug development, and I was doing that in order to. It's a very interesting program because it's technically pharmaceutical drug development, but a lot of the coursework is actually natural medicinal products and uh, dietary supplements and mechanisms. So I was doing it to get better at formulating and to a deeper level understand uh, both how we make medicines out of drugs and also how I could make better formulas by having a more methodical approach to toward finding new ingredients right. and also developing out, you know, fi finding things that no one has found yet. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm in my last class, uh, right now. I oh, have wow. one assignment left until I graduate. Um, that's due Monday. So after probably by the time this comes out, I will be done, which is just like, I think I'm the type of person who, um, I have to always have a challenge, like a next challenge on the horizon. And if not, I'm depressed or I feel like I'm not doing anything, uh, like I'm not achieving anything. Um, and when I lost lifting, which we talked about quite a bit last time, um, I, I think I needed something else to pull me forward or to push myself in a way that I, I wasn't able to do any more physically. So I decided to do this program that at the time felt I was intimidated by it. Like mm. I, um, in nutrition, you don't have a lot of chemistry. Uh, so I applied to it, not even thinking I'd, I'd get in. And then when I did, I was like, fuck, am I even going to be able to make it? And the first semester was tough. Uh, and that was three years ago. So now to look back on it and be like, I didn't think I could do this. And then now to be, have it pass me and look back and just, it's weird. It's almost like going into a new country. And when you first, uh, visit, you're overwhelmed by the new words and the details. And, but then if you stick around and you don't move back and leave, you automatically are speaking the new language. You don't even, right. don't even realize it. Um, and that's kind of how, how chemistry is. It's, it's just its own language. And I think that, uh, yeah, it's just, it's super duper duper gratifying. Um, and I look forward to having a little bit of that mental space back again. Um, because the company, the coaching and grad school was like pulling you every way. Yeah. Yeah. I felt like a tidal wave was crashing me down every day. I can absolutely see that. That's really tough. <laughs> Yeah, but that's why I, that's the messed up part of me is it, it's just you know how there's there's a a definite masochistic element to lifting yes. <laughs> where like you you want to break yourself a little bit you want to see like, if you can I, do it. <laughs> yeah, I think I needed to still satisfy that, and since I couldn't so much in the gym, like I still lift, and but that's what I loved so much about powerlifting training is, uh, it felt more of a psychological challenge than bodybuilding training did to me and i think i got addicted to that and then when i lost that aspect training wise because i couldn't do i couldn't train like that anymore i needed to fill that void somehow mm. it's like school became that which is weird but i think we can keep that this can kick off the podcast i think it's a good uh chat sure. and and actually it what is there anything you're kind of what's next do you have something already in mind of what's next i imagine you have something so it, it's funny because I think, and this is always why I, I like to um, not just stay in one field so much and become too much of a specialist because things pop up that you didn't even expect to happen. So now what's happening is I, I do have a, a vague interest in drug development, like pharmaceutical drug development, but uh, there's, there's a field called pharmacognosy which is basically, it's strictly related to using 
um, natural products to develop drugs from. And, mm. and still 50% of drugs, pharmaceuticals on the ma- market come from natural products, which is an amazing statistic to think about. Yeah. That. So we look at the pharmaceutical industry and think, well, these are just these chemists making drugs out of nowhere. Uh, but half still one out of every two drugs comes from a plant, um, or a natural product, which is amazing. So I, that tells you like the incredible value of of nature and of plant products. So I think, I think what happened was originally when I went in, I went in thinking like, all right, well, maybe I'll want to work for a drug company. Maybe I want to invent this totally new drug. And I think what I fell into was actually falling deeper in love with, um, herbals and supplement ingredients and, and realizing like, wow, all of these mechanisms, uh, that number one, we found them from needing to define a way that this plant product worked. For example, like nicotinic uh, cholinergic receptors. Nicotinic, they're called that because of nicotine. So we know that they cause that because nicotine binds with that receptor. Or like cannabinoid receptors. We know that because cannabinoids, the active compounds in marijuana, bind with that receptor. Uh, or like uh, opioid receptors. We know... We, we've named them that because of opium, which uh, we make morphine from. Uh, it's it's a natural product from from opium poppies. So I think as I started to learn more of the history and all of these you know things started to come out at me, I was like, holy shit! Like we, we think that. Don't don't get me wrong. I, I think um, synthetic organic chemists, people who work in a lab and make compounds for a living. They are impressively intelligent. They're impressively um, creative. There's so many impressive things, but plants are still the master chemists. Like they do this as a byproduct of metabolism right. and oftentimes to survive. So um, a- anyway, I-, I think I think I just <laughs> I have trouble answering the question because there's so many you know possible ways. But I think I think where it really is going is. Um, it's just a deeper and deeper interest in both natural medicinal products. And at some point, if I find I reach a ceiling with supplements, then maybe I will, you know, go into pharmaceutical. But I think I continue to be humbled, especially starting from nutrition Mm. and realizing the impact of plant compounds and foods and having their nutritional uh, value and effects and now getting this other end of it. I think it just makes me deeper in love with not wanting to go the overpotent side right. that a lot of pharmaceuticals do. Cause so think of it this way. Um, and this is the last thing I'll, I'll say before, you know, we move on to the next question is, um, when obviously at, at this point, you know, marijuana is getting legalized many places, it's more accepted and, and adopted. What a, a drug company does, for example, like Marinol is a drug that's just straight THC. It's isolated pure like 99 point whatever percent thc um whereas marijuana is not just thc it's a it's a mixture of cannabinoids so cbd and and other uh cannabinoids and we know that those have pharmacological activity too so if you look at the plant only as what one thing can i isolate that is the strongest i think that's kind of a short-sighted view um, but the only way it can become a drug and become patented and monopolized is by doing it that way. So I think we miss something in doing that. And, and I'm not so sure I want to go down that path because I'm interested in all of the colors in the spectrum, not right. just one. No, I think that's really interesting. And a, a question that's like coming into my head that I really wanted to ask. And I, I feel kind of strange that I don't know the answer to this myself. And I'm sure many of the listeners actually don't know. But what, what differentiates then like a drug to a supplement? Where, where do we draw the line? Where does that, is there like a distinction? Yeah. So, and that's a good question. That's actually been the focal point of my last, my last course. Uh, so basically the line, there is some gray, but the line is a supplement has to be part of the food supply. Um, so if it's not, that automatically makes it fall into a drug. Uh, and then you have these weird gray area things that have drug compounds. For example, like red, red yeast rice has a statin in it. Uh, statins are drugs. The reason that you can sell red yeast rice, 
um, and it's not classified as a drug is because it's not isolated. It's not the one statin that's isolated. Um, so if you took out that one statin and you purified it and it was just that, now it's a drug. If you're doing it in red yeast rice with it, which is the, the full spectrum of everything that's, you know, grown from the, I believe it's a fungus actually, um, that grows on red, uh, on yeast, uh, or rice yeast, um, then it's, then it's still a supplement. Uh, so that's, that's the same kind of concept where, uh, and see, that's why CBD is gray area. Okay. Because right now, um, it doesn't quite, it fits more the classification of drug and it's probably going to get classified. I act, I've actually been reading more and seeing that they're moving closer towards it being classified as a drug. So it'll be interesting to see how that gets upended soon. Uh, do you know, I mean, cause CBD has been one of those ones that kind of came in as a bit of a, like, I guess it's, it's almost been a little bit of a fad because it came in like yep. every single fit influencer, um, if that's the term, um, yep. were like sharing it and they had affiliate codes. And even I'd been offered, I think people had offered uh, Revive Stronger as a brand because we had an article reviewing CBD and they offered us stuff so they could advertise. And yep. um, and then it's kind of disappeared a little bit. Uh, what, have you looked into the research there? What are your, do you think there's applications for it particularly or? Yeah, it seems like the strongest role is uh, as an anxiolytic, so like an anti-anxiety, um, compound. Um, and, but it's not, it's not, a uh, psychoactive, so it doesn't c cause the same, like, time, uh, distortion and things that are pretty classical of, of THC. Um, but it does influence neurotransmitters. Neurotrans uh, so it, it does have an impact, but I, they still haven't defined the mechanism exactly of CBD. That's part of the problem. Um, and I do think once that's more clearly defined, that it's probably going to move closer towards being scheduled or classified as a, as a drug. Uh, but yeah, I think it's very intriguing. Um, and of course, I think once the supplement industry gets hold of an ingredient like that, um, and they find that they can it might not be the best word, but exploit it yeah. while there's time to, I, I think that's what's happened. Um, so I do think something's there. I think there's a lot more questions than answers, but I, I do think the absolute most, both notable effects anecdotally from people using it and, uh, mechanistically seems to be the anti-anxiety, uh, component. So it's probably something with, with GABA, which is a neurotransmitter. Um, and I, I think there was something with uh, serotonin and dopamine as well, but uh, I'd have to go back and look into that too. It was a little bit ago when I when I was looking at CBD mechanism, but it's fascinating. Yeah, it's always when I see a new supplement come out, I'm always I, I tend to be on the side of let the new kind of uh, I don't know what the word is. Let people take that on, see if they get anything yeah. from it. Let more research yeah. come out and maybe then use it later. Is that how you tend to view things as well, or? I guess you're excited by supplements more than a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, that, that's no, that's that's a that's a really good question because I think um, the answer is difficult because I, I'm on both sides. Whereas I think if I was the consumer, my answer would be wait and see if it hangs around and survives. So a great example of that is like five years ago, every other form of creatine rather than monohydrate was popular, and it was being pitched as the new creatine the new more effective version of it and look look at which one has survived monohydrate um which is ironic because we we've known that monohydrate was the best and was the most of, was an effective form beyond needing to make new versions in the 1920s uh so yeah I, I think the interesting thing is there's this marketing hype and and there is a danger in being educated on marketing um, or letting marketing be your only entry in to something. Um, so I do think people should should be skeptical to start. Absolutely. Uh, so that's my answer from the consumer end is people should always start off skeptical uh, and ask a lot of questions and ask what way is that they've shown this and can prove this or, or through what mechanisms or what research. Uh, for me, on the end of product R&D, though, I'm trying to be ahead of that curve yeah. because if I'm ahead of that curve, I'm ahead of not just the consumer, but also the other companies who are chasing that. So 
the way I'm looking at ingredients and products is going to be different is I'm looking mechanism first, not user feedback first. So not like, what did you feel from this? What did everybody else say in the gym of this? I need to find the mechanism first, then try it, then create that anecdotal uh, a reason to, to try it and then get the anecdote in myself and see, okay, does my subjective experience complement what the mechanism is? Can I feel what it says should be happening? And then I'll go and share it with a few, a small group of people and see if it's, um, that same feeling is universal. And then I know I'm onto something. Um, so it's, it's basically I'm using uh, the principles of drug development, but in there's a there's a term bioassaying, which basically means I'm using my body as my analytical tool, right. as my lab tool, um, because I don't have available to me all of the technologies that a drug company uh, does. And I think the bigger part is ultimately my endpoint is making a supplement that someone's going to feel right. So. If I can prove it in uh, in a, a petri dish or something, but it has no subjective effect, the likelihood that that's going to be well adopted as a supplement is so low. So um, I, I think it, it works well for the industry I'm in. Where if I was in a drug, uh, a pharmaceutical company, uh, a lot more of those robust computer modeling things would probably be more appropriate. Whereas for me, I, I guess I fit better in supplements right now. Have you got any examples where you've you've done that, where you have been ahead of the curve, or? Um, yeah, so I, I think our most popular product, Utopia, is, is that example. Awesome. Um, so if you look back, and it's it would be hard for people to do, um, unless they were supplement consumers around that time. Everybody was using uh, sodium, or um, they were using choline bitartrate or choline citrate, like. Uh, it's, it's an acetylcholine precursor, but the problem is it's mostly taken up by your liver. So it doesn't reach your brain. And uh, if you want to have a nootropic effect or a cognitive enhancing effect of acetylcholine, it needs to reach the target tissue, which mm -hmm. is the brain. It can't be taken up by the liver and not get into the blood. Then it's not going to do shit. Um, at least for your brain. Um, so I was, uh, I think at that point I was, I was just looking, I was reading, I was more so buying everything, testing everything on myself and seeing if it was an effect. It was almost like the opposite process of what I do now. I was buying, trying, and then trying to figure it out where like why it, why it did that. Whereas now I'm trying to figure out why it does potentially does that. Then I'm trying it. So it's like top down versus bottom up. Um, anyway, uh, so I found this, this ingredient called, uh, citicoline, which was under the license form cognizant, and it was sold as just a single ingredient. No one was using it in formulas. No one was. And when I used it, I was like, wow, this is way different. And I had used, you know, different choline salts before. Uh, and this felt way different. And I was kind of shocked by it. And that Utopia was the first product that used cognizant. Um, in a multi-ingredient profile that was just aimed at being anotropic. Because at that time when that product came out, pre-workouts dominated the market. Yeah. No one was really making cognitive enhancers. That was 2013, 2014. Um, so it was still, that was still the pre-workout era. The category of cognitive was not nearly built out. Um, some of the other ingredients in the formula were used, but nothing was used in that combination. Uh, but I think more than anything, um, that turned my brain on to something. I, I, I really think that was the precursor to me getting involved actually in the pharmaceutical chem program because I wanted to better explain how I stumbled upon this, this thing that was different than everything. Like I achieved exactly the endpoint I wanted, but I couldn't necessarily explain how I got there. And I had a problem with that. Um, Cause yeah, I, I thrive on being able to explain it. Cause if I can't, then, then I'm confused. And I'm like, well, how am I going to explain it to anybody else? Like, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's the most memorable one. And then every product we've had since there has been at least an element of, um, 
either repurposing an ingredient based on a mechanism or finding an ingredient that's not used. Like, for example, Ignite, um, very few people still use it. Uh, VasoDrive AP, which is a peptide that's isolated from, from casein protein, actually. It's a three amino acid peptide, uh, that, that blocks, um, a vasoconstrictive pathway. So a pathway that limits blood flow. And I found that actually through my, through one of my assignments in school, we were looking at peanut peptides that, um, block, uh, I think it's AVP one or two. It's arginine vasopressin. Vasopressin just means vas, uh, constriction of blood vessel. And the entire, uh, assignment was looking at these peanut peptides. And I was looking at the sequence of the peptides and I was like, well, shit. There's got to be multiple other food products that that do this, that have, you know, peptides that have this pharmacological effect. So I just started digging and I and I found the license form, which is what we use now, Vasodrive AP, and found that they had studied it in human trials and showed that it improved blood pressure scores uh, in, in human populations. And it worked on that mechanism. And it, it so it was crazy because the purpose of the assignment was to talk about the peanut peptides and then do a computer modeling showing basically how that compound should interact with the receptor, uh, which is really cool. Like it, actually, if you look back in my Instagram stories or my, my feed, you can see the, I actually posted one of my, um, the result of one of my assignments where it looks at the top modeling of different positions of how a compound docks with the receptor. Um, so anyway, kind of nerdy stuff, but it, it, it goes somewhere, I guess is my point is yeah. like, uh, that led me to better development of something else. And I'm always chasing that new thing. Yeah. And, and I think that allows, that's like the carrot that's pulling me forward always is, uh, I look at it as what is the, what's the barrier to innovation in supplements and I think it's either knowledge or creativity. Yeah. I don't, I don't think supplements are dead. I refuse to believe that. So I think they can keep scheduling or, uh, banning compounds like, like 13 dimethyl or DMAA. Uh, and I think there's, there's two routes to go with that. You can look at it and you can say, okay, they've banned DMAA. Now pre-workouts are never going to be good or the same again. And, you can go the more gray area route and have an underground chemist make you a new compound that's just not under the scheduling yet, but it's technically illegal and it will get scheduled. Or you can say, what pathways does this compound operate on? Can I mimic those pathways through a natural compound that's never going to get banned? And that's the route that I prefer to go through because I think it's more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I think the awesome part is I learn so much more about physiology. Like, uh, just in formulating, um, cognitive enhancing products, I've learned so much more about neurotransmitters or, um, same thing with pre-workouts and, and blood flow and, um, all of those things. Like I, it, it's always the, the dual component of, I get to learn so much more in a way that directly is applicable, um, and then there's that excitement, that discovery element of like, I want to find something new. I want to find something new. Yeah, I think that's why um, like DeNovo as a brand is exciting because you are always like looking to develop and further um, and making sure that the ingredients within products are kind of solid and founded. Um, whereas I guess other companies are not always like that. So uh, if you look at, if you look at the average pre-workout formula profile, almost everybody's doing the same thing. And I think I always look at it and say, if I'm not excited, how is anybody else going to get excited? You know what I mean? So if that's not exciting to me, why even do it? Because you're starting off on, on a, on a starting point that's the same. Um, so you have to stand out somehow. And if we can't, we're just not going to do it. Uh, and I thought for the longest time, We'll, we'll never make any kind of fat loss product. And then I kind of fell into more stuff on serotonin and 5-HTP and appetite. And I was like, wow, okay, this makes a ton of sense. This is unique. No one's doing this. Hell yeah, let's do it. Like now, now there's a reason to be excited and intrigued and do something different. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to knock the supplement industry so much because I I love that part about it because I feel like it gives us a niche, yeah. like it gives us an in. But um, there are there are companies out there who innovate. And I will say this. It's gotten so much better than it used to be. Mm. Like the reason that competition is, is at an all time high and that I'm always panicked is because the formulas are so much better now than they used to be. Like it was easy before when everybody was just using arginine and they'd, you know, put in five, six grams of arginine and just a bunch of caffeine and everybody would use the pre-workout and go shit before they go lift. Like (laughs) it was so easy to just make a product that works and doesn't make people have to go to the bathroom first. Um, now it's, it's every component of product development, like supplement companies that really are good are operating more like pharmaceutical companies where, now stuff tastes really good. It tastes like candy. It tastes like a fruit drink. There's like all these different delivery methods. There's like sustained release versus rapid release. Uh, there's gummies and chewables and, and gum. And, um, as far as like ingredient solubility now, like you don't have a bunch of stuff falling to the bottom. Like it's, I, I, that makes me excited to stay in because it's like now we're at a point where, Everybody who was just like blanket saying supplements don't work, they're a waste of time, they're bullshit, they have to reconsider that position because it's like like there is this legitimacy that, that's now, I feel like, coming to the forefront that's been deserved for a while of companies who were doing it mm-hmm. that still exist. Um, like if you look at companies who have lasted 20, 30 years, 40 years, um, they have been pretty much doing legitimacy from the start. Yeah. Uh, so... Yeah, I don't, I, I, it's, if it wasn't still excited, I, I, I wouldn't keep doing it. And on the note of kind of supplements, like they don't do anything, they're useless. I think pre-workouts are one of those that for the longest time, everyone was taking a pre-workout, it was super exciting. And then there's become a bit of a phase of just have a black coffee or whatever it might be. And I'd love to just hear your thoughts on just having a black coffee versus having uh, like a variety of different, like a blend of for a pre-workout and what the difference yeah. is there and what benefits people are potentially missing out on um, or if there is any. So, yeah, I think these questions are always very individual dependent. There's nothing wrong with having coffee. There's nothing wrong with having no pre-workout. Do I, do I think it's like, your gains are going to be lost if you don't use a pre-workout. I don't. Um, I think ways that you can either get stuff that coffee doesn't offer or that using nothing doesn't offer is number one is obviously stimulation and excitement to go train. Um, the undeniable effect of caffeine is that it, it makes you feel less fatigued and more energetic. So that's the obvious component that you will both get with coffee and with the pre-workout. Um, where they begin to separate is the main active in coffee is caffeine. So you're going to basically get the short term stimulation and then you're going to fall off pretty quick. Uh, when you get a, a well formulated pre workout where you have things that either extend the half life, so they reduce the metabolism of caffeine so it lasts longer, or there's other stimulants rather than just caffeine, you will get a, you can get a longer uh, duration of stimulation. You can get a more powerful one if you combine other stimulants that are more than just caffeine or things that work on pathways that complement caffeine. Um, then there's other things that, uh, compounds that work on different neurotransmitters. Um, so like we use Yohimbine in Ignite, uh, cause it's a potent stimulant. It also works on a different pathway to caffeine. So it makes it a stronger stimulation and it also, um, it, it feels different. And same thing with, like I said before about, uh, acetylcholine. Um, so if you increase acetylcholine, you will feel something. If you increase dopamine, you will feel something very different than just giving caffeine and blocking, um, uh, adenosine receptors, which is again, different mechanisms. So, um, when you look at ingredients and supplementation as mechanisms, not just feels, you can start to really separate out controlling different things. Um, and then I think there, so that's really looking at it only from a stimulation perspective. Mm -hmm. Then you have things like endurance, 
Um, so ingredients like citrulline, obviously the tried and true creatine, like you're not going to get that in coffee. You can drop it into your coffee. Sure. It'll dissolve better because it's hot fluid. Um, but, uh, so you, you get advantages like those. And then just kind of the superficial things like, like a pump, like blood flow. Um, so I, I think the main thing is really if you find that coffee isn't enough or you want something more than coffee, that's when it's worthwhile to look into pre-workouts. Um, again, I, I don't look at it as black and white as you have to, or you're missing something or you're, you're never going to reach your goals. If you're not using pre-workout supplements, that's not true. Um, it just really comes down to, uh, do you really love the thing you're doing and does it do what you want it to stick with it for sure. Um, if you're looking for something more or something to help you get through harder training things or feel a little different, then that's where I think supplements kind of come in more. Um, I think the major difference though with pre-workouts above any other category is that the effects are primarily short term. So your supplementation of a pre-workout, just like with coffee, it's going to benefit you more for that session rather than like something like a creatine, which you'll see the benefits after three, four weeks. Um, cause nothing's building up in your system. Mm -hmm. If it was, you'd die from cardiac arrest. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Um, I think that's the, that's, of course you can kind of really go down to the nitty gritty of every single ingredient, but I think stimulant based formulas will always be for short term, um, goals. Whereas, uh, things like protein and things like creatine are definitely more long-term mm -hmm. accrued goal things. Cool. Yeah. And I think, um, something I've often heard at least, and I, I guess this is something you alluded to a little bit, and I, I don't know if companies on like the large scale are thinking about it much, but it's like a lot of people talk about that crash after taking a pre-workout and you kind of talked about that with coffee potentially because it's just the caffeine, you might get that crash. Uh, are, are many companies really considering that? I know that's something you heavily consider kind of the dosing and the time response and the complete product. Um, I think, <laughs> I think it, it depends. I think some companies are, yes, but I think the majority of what I see, they're looking at it from a business approach because people are looking for this. So they market towards it rather than actually trying to address it, uh, pharmacologically. Um, so I think that's really where companies can separate is like, is it just a business or is it a scientific endeavor that also functions as a business? Um, so I, I do see more people talking about, you know, no crash, uh, anti-crash and, and kind of notoriously, we recently had a conversation, uh, with one of the products in, in the gamer market in a non, uh, fitness market, uh, with another company who was claiming that their vitamin, uh, complex prevents crash, which is ridiculous. That's 100% marketing hype. There is absolutely nothing to back up that a large dose of vitamins prevents crash from caffeine. So um, I think that sort of addresses it is like, I think a lot of companies talk about doing it mm -hmm. because they want to make the claim and get the people to buy in. But how much are they really investing in doing it uh, in backing up what they say? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, I think that that's a, that's a big, that's a big part of it for us. For me too, is like, I'm, I'm making a product as a consumer. I'm yeah. making it so I don't have to go buy other products. You know what I mean? So if, if I feel like we can't back that up and I don't even want to use it, then why the fuck are we going to scale it up and make it on a large scale? Yeah. You know? I completely see that. Um, and are there any, when a consumer is looking at a pre-workout, is there any kind of telltale signs of one that maybe is just like they're heavily just relying on marketing and they're not really thinking through the formula and any like when you're looking at them as any you're just like this is just obviously kind of it's got an ingredient or maybe proprietary bends i don't know if they particularly exist anymore yeah so they still do um i think i think the first thing that uh any customer should always do is learn to educate themselves on on labels even just the basics of labels and you know what really sucks is there's not great educational resources out there for supplements. There's not, there's no programs that just deal with dietary supplements. Um, I think 
So let's start with two great places that I still use all the time. Um, examine.com is excellent to read the label, see what ingredients are in there, look them up on examine, see if they actually have data to back them up. Uh, another one is consumer lab. There is a paywall for that to get the encyclopedia articles, but it's totally worth it. They also, uh, pick random supplements off shelves and test them to see if they, their claims match out. Um, so that's a, an awesome website. Um, th- if people are more interested in mechanistic stuff, drug bank CA is drug bank.ca is great. It talks about all the different mechanisms of not just supplement ingredients, but, um, uh, pharmaceutical compounds. Uh, so if they want to educate themselves better, even if they're taking, you know, pharmaceuticals, I think that's a great starting point. I use that a lot for my coursework, um, and for my own research, uh, chemicalize.org is another great one. That's, they're progressively getting more nerdy as I talk about them. Um, There's a lot. So chemicalize, There's more than I thought. <laughs> uh, chemicalize is excellent because you can look at the properties of a drug. You can predict its solubility. You can um, see at what what range uh, it actually gets charged. Um, so that can use, be used for prediction of things like solubility. Also, like if it will pass the blood-brain barrier and get into your brain. Um yeah, it answers a lot of really cool questions. So I, I think those are great starting points from the most simple uh, all the way up to, you know, if someone really has an interest in, you know, chemistry and, and drug, you know, pharmacology, drug development. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think in general, pertaining to a label, you should always look at the serving size uh, and then look at the active in there. And these are very simple principles for every supplement out there across for all the way from fish oil to whey protein is – uh, for example, look at the serving size and then look at how many grams of protein are in there. The less percentage of the serving size that is protein, obviously you're getting more filler. You're not getting as much of what you're paying for. When you look at, um, something like fish oil, look at the total omega threes, um, versus the fat and, and the fish oil content. Like a lot of them are like 55, 60%. That's, that's pretty low. If you're paying a lot for that, you're you're not getting what you pay for. You're getting marketing. Uh, so I think just looking at simple ways that companies are legally required to tell you to see if they're lying to you. Right. Um, so like they can tell you anything they want. For the most part, they can't make drug function like treat or prevent or cure diseases. They can't make claims like that. But they can say like enhance brain function, enhance blood flow. Uh, those are marketing claims. What is the label? The supplement facts label say that actually, you know, falls in line with that. Um, look for other ingredients. Definitely look for proprietary blends. They're, they're becoming less and less, but, uh, I think that should automatically make, you know, red flags go up. Um, I think anytime there's really a laundry list of ingredients, the really the important thing for people to understand is the more ingredients you put in, the more chaos the less predictability. So the the one thing that you can't deny about drug companies and pharmaceutical drugs is they're required to do a lot of cl- clinical trials, a lot of mechanistic studies to find out how this thing works. When they're doing those, they're not combining it with four or five other things. So th- they're able to confidently say, this does this. When you put in a, a strong stimulant in a pre-workout and then you put in 40 other things, even if they're underdosed, there's an element of unpredictability in that where you don't know if they're putting in a compound that detracts from that effect. You don't know if they're putting in something that enhances it. A lot of times you see people putting in like piperine just across the board in every supplement to enhance uh, absorption and bioavailability. That's not always a good thing. Mm. Like you don't necessarily want to increase absorption of a strong stimulant a thousand percent. So I think there's these weird blanket things that I tend to see in formulas that are like, Man, that could be really dangerous. Right. Um, so yeah, read labels. Uh, don't so much buy into marketing. Look at the places that are legally required to tell you, uh, which is the supplement facts panel, the ingredients and the other ingredients. And then I think the last part that I see all the time, because <laughs> of course, big data is a thing. You can't run away from it. Um, probably because I talk about supplements so much and my phone records it and I 
like all of my data out there is about supplements. I constantly get pitched uh, Instagram ads on pre-workouts and supplements. So I click on them and I look at the formula and it blows my mind how many websites do not even show you the supplement facts panel. Wow. Or like you have to click through like four or five pages to see what the formula is. Like that scares the shit out of me. Mm. It seriously blows my mind. Um, so I think people really, really, really need to demand to see more before they buy and not make it so much that this is my favorite, you know, uh, influencer who uses it. This is my favorite, like, like ask questions. It's okay. And asking questions is your best way of finding out if someone is spewing you shit. Uh, cause then if you ask a good question, they can't run away from it. And, and that, that, that answers your question within the question is like, should I give this person my money? Yeah. No, I think that's fantastic. The kind of the list of things you went through there, it's like hopefully really making people think because a lot of the time, especially like pre-workouts, they're just so heavily driven via marketing and hype and like flashy, like people look at the container more so than they look at the actual panel on the back. And it's kind of like, that's a scary prospect for people to be wasting money, but also potentially harming even things could be not doing what they want. You know, what's crazy. It's funny that you say that because, uh, I, I love art and visuals, so I love the fact that we have to have a nice label, but yeah. at the same time, I hate the fact that it's like equally as important as the, the formula and the profile. Yeah. Um, but you're totally right. Like packaging is a factor. And if you ignore it, you lose and you die. Um, so, uh, I, I, I think, the, you know, my naive initial place I started was like, everybody's going to care about these things. Everybody wants to read the panels. If I just put out the good information and the, the right formula, it's all going to take care of itself. And unfortunately it's not that simple. Um, but I think now the way I look at it is okay. So we have to be at least as good or close to as good on all of those other things like the packaging and the marketing, but I want to make sure we're bringing them into something that is legit that we, you know, are proud of that we can stand behind that we know works. Um, so it's interesting to operate in a field and in a, in an area that's like that because I definitely can be an idealist and I want to just be like, no, 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 that doesn't exist. That doesn't happen. But I think the challenge of business has taught me that ignoring it is a bad thing. I think this, this is going to be, this could potentially be a really interesting chat because I think it's something even like ourselves and I'm sure you've had to deal with outside of supplementation is that like science is kind of getting a bit sexier, but like evidence-based yeah. practice, uh, it's not always like looked upon as particularly like, I don't know, you don't see many evidence-based practitioners having like hundreds of thousands, like Brett Contreras is kind of like, the reason right. he's got a million followers is because he puts pictures of people's ass up all the time. Yep. <laughs> so yep. There's kind of a, we don't like to think that we need to do that, but maybe we need a little bit more of that kind of sex selling element in our kind of what we need to do to get that information across to people. I I think, I think to deny it or ignore it or, um, get angry about it is to actually undermine yourself. And I think, unfortunately, I've had to realize that the slow and painful way. Um, but I, I think that's what, uh, sort of grace is is having a balance of of both you can't be too far on one end yeah um again like i said before is if we were a company that was just hyperbole marketing i wouldn't want to be part of it like that would ruin it for me um so yeah i i it's weird because this goes now way back to it's not even science now. It's like, it's psychologically what drives us to do these things. And I think if you're finding that the reasoning behind building a company or something like that is just the attention and social element, not necessarily, not necessarily saying that's bad, but you probably shouldn't be in a science field doing it if that's your driver. Uh, because you're ultimately not going to help people. You're going to help you and people are going to end up getting confused and worse off than they started. And, and I think, I don't know, I think there's a danger in it. So I, I want to be careful with how I explain it because good and bad is, is a, I, I've gotten an interesting view of good and bad over the years of, of being in business. And 
And um, I think that I think ultimately you can't forget why you started, how you started and your internal value values and those need to guide you. Um, and so I don't necessarily think it's bad if, if someone wants a ton of attention or they want to grow something where it's primarily about them, but it shouldn't be disingenuous or fake. Like, or if your, if your goal is ultimately, uh, value of content and education, that should be 80% of what you do. 20% should then maybe like, you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it should influence your ratio. But as soon as it starts to compete and you lose your balance, I feel like you lose your way, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it's, on, on a completely personal level, th that's an interesting struggle. But the place I always come back to is like, why did I start this? Like, why, why did I do this? Why do I still do this? Um, and what keeps me in this? Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's not bad to keep going back and checking that. And even if you have to write it down or something, you know what yeah. I mean? And just look at it. Um, but to say it doesn't exist and it's not a factor is just, is being delusional at this mm -hmm. point. I mean, look at Instagram. It, it has changed the game. Look at Amazon. They've changed the game. Um, and it sucks because, you know, on this one end where I live, it's a small town in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a lot of mom and pop restaurants mm -hmm. or even mom and pop, pop like sewing shops and stuff. So to see big, these big chains who are doing an amazing job at marketing and uh, getting people's attention, it sucks to see the purists or the people who are probably doing a better job yeah. on each single job getting overtaken. But I don't think that means give up. I think that just means find your way to compete, but keep your you in yeah. doing it, right? Yeah, I love the, the just the idea of like the where de novo has come and you can see that with the, how the packaging has changed over time and it's you don't lose the core principles of the product still fantastic. And I think um, people in like our field, like I, I don't know if it's right to call it evidence based practice because that's now kind of taking the wrong term in many ways. Definitely but right, yeah. um, it it's kind of like maybe we need a bit more of like that mix in some of those. I know I've seen I, I've even spoken to like especially females, it seems to be more so like they do posts informational posts and then every like i don't know fifth post it's like just a glute shot and that gets them a load of new followers yep. draws people in it's like maybe that's like a nice balance to find where you can draw some people in but also get good information hopefully across to them it it sucks but it works um so yeah i yeah i mean i, I don't have anything to say beyond that you're, you're totally right but i think if the majority of time the content's valuable it's not just butt sheets it's all right. <laughs> yeah, hundred um, percent. And it's something I definitely wanted to ask. Um, this might be the last question. It depends where it goes. But in terms of like future things that you're looking at in terms of supplements, is there anything, if you can talk about it, maybe I'd need a new question if you can't talk about it because it could be top secret. But is there anything you're looking at? I know recently even you put it on your story. So maybe that's one thing you can talk about. Um, yeah. So always looking at new flavors. Uh, so new flavors of each line for sure. Um, we are working on a sleep product. Um, I think as much as I'm comfortable saying now is that we do use unique ingredients that no one is using. It basically follows all the principles I talked about. Um, of course there's common things that you'll be used to seeing like melatonin in there. Right. Um, but, uh, we address it from a couple different pathways and angles, like we do with Utopia, like we do with Ignite. This product will, is no different. Um, so I am excited about that. I actually bought this Aura Ring. Uh, I thought that was an Aura Ring. Yeah, so um, that's that's why I bought it, to actually track my sleep. Interesting. And I'm probably gonna try to go actually get uh, a polysomnography as well um, for a couple nights with nothing and then taking the, su the supplement. It's gonna be called Zen. I'm okay with giving the name, it, name, name away. Um, and I have a couple other things that I, I've actually recently immediately have come up that are more down the academic path, uh, mm -hmm. which may become products may not. One of them is, um, looking at a way to eliminate beta alanine, um, itch. So being wow. able to dose it, um, as high as you want without getting the itch, which eliminates that, 
um, that limitation of underdosing beta alanine. Uh, that one's really interesting. I'm super excited about that. I'm actually talking uh, to a few people uh, right now um, to try to actually research it. Um, so I don't, I don't know that that could be a while off if it ever becomes a product. Mm. If not, uh, it'd be cool to publish on it. Um, and then, uh, I'm just, I'm doing some analytical testing on another ingredient that we want to use to actually extend duration of caffeine. Uh, to my knowledge, no one is using, uh, this licensed form of the ingredient. I've seen one company, uh, this is as comfortable as I feel about giving it away. Muscle tech has used the plant form of the ingredient. Um, but, uh, so I'm actually doing some testing at a local college. Um, it's actually someone I went to high school with. Her name is Jill Conte. Uh, she, the school is Keystone college. They're a small, you know, college near me and they just got a GCMS. It's a gas, chromat- uh, gas chromatograph mass spec. Basically it's an analytical instrument where you could feed in a sample and not only can you see, uh, what compounds are in there, but you could also quantify them so you could see how much. Um, uh, so it's like one of the best analytical tests. Um, and I'm trying to actually ensure that the standardization they're claiming, uh, is actually there, uh, doing it ourselves independently. And if it is, then we'll probably be using that in the product too. Mm-hmm. Um, hoping that that doesn't come out before I finish testing. Uh, but again, these are things that I don't so much worry about because at least we have that extra layer of validation, um, before it just goes out Mm -hmm. arbitrarily to the market and people are like marketing, marketing, marketing. Oh, does that actually work or (laughs) not? And it's really, I don't know if it makes me really interested to think like, especially for like performance and physique based things like we have like the fat loss supplements or at least we have the suppressant um at the moment that you guys are doing and we're pre-workouts now we have like sleep supplements is there any areas that you kind of are wishing there was a supplement that could help with that i don't know if it's like recovery um obviously sleep's part of that or um i guess um, i think i think the way this whole journey started for me was actually with um muscle growth and i don't think since of course. I mean, I started off as a bodybuilder. Like that's, that's an interesting endpoint for any bodybuilder. Um, any fitness person really. Uh, so I think that never has totally left. Um, I think driving changes in body comp are very interesting. I I think doing it through just one compound, especially for fat loss is extremely difficult in terms of burning fat. I think the way I can't imagine we will find a better way than, what we currently do, which is reducing appetite because the, the, the issue you always collide with, with reducing fat mass, um, by giving a compound is making someone hyperthermic and actually melting them like, like, uh, and killing them because of body temperature rising too much. Um, maybe I just don't know enough about the physiology of it, but as of right now, that that's the major limitation in fat loss. Um, via just taking, ingesting a product. Um, I think for muscle mass, I'll never stop looking. I'm really interested, uh, especially with the advent of, you know, uh, of SARMs of, you know, next generation aromatase inhibitors. Not that we're going to go down that line at, for, as de novo, but I think, um, anytime that a new drug comes out, usually they've done it by finding a unique way that some structural modification on the compound interacts with the receptor. That's why, like, they call them uh, first generation, like, for example, aromatase inhibitors. Mm. There's first generation aromatase inhibitors. There's second generation. There's third generation. Each generation, the end point and the goal is to improve potency and improve uh, what's called therapeutic index, which basically means uh, the the gap between when you see a large amount of therapeutic effects and the beginning of seeing toxic effects. So the larger that gap is, the better. Um, so they're always trying to aim for that in, in drug development. Um, so anyway, using stuff like that, data like that, or compound information like that to find either natural products that do something similar 
or maybe a combination of natural products that might do something similar. I just think, and this isn't being defeatist, I just think that will always be difficult because there's so much more money to make in a pharmaceutical company finding it, patenting it, developing it, blowing it out than one dude uh, versus a team of a pharmaceutical industry who has billions and billions of dollars. Uh, but it's still very interesting to me. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's probably a degree of division between intellectual interest and actual practical product mm -hmm. endpoints. But I, I do think muscle mass will always be interesting to me. And probably like making, binding new compounds together or um, making new things that could still be supplements is fascinating to me. Even just salts of ingredients. Uh, like we did that before we changed from um, from cognizant to acetylcholine sodium and we did that for solubility. Um, so finding ways to either make new salts or find new salts of ingredients to change simple things like how well something dissolves in fluid. Right. Uh, Long-winded answer, but I think that's really everything where my head's at right now. Uh, just one that's come into my head in terms of like uh, muscle mass and things like this, and I know they're on the market at the moment, and um, I don't know if you've got much of an opinion on it, but like glucose disposal agents, um, that's one that is out there at the moment. Do you, how, how are you looking at that? Um, so I, I think they're, they're interesting. I think uh, you there's always some type of inherent drawback in something like that. One of them being usually those are not selective glucose disposal agents, so uh, they will help muscle uptake, uh, but that means they'll also help fat uptake glucose because uh, things like GLUT4 aren't just on... GLUT4 is like the primary glucose disposal agent in, in muscle, but it's also on fat cells, on adipocytes too. So if you in, improve um, glucose sensitivity in tissues via glucose transporters, it's usually non-selective, um, and I don't see any way that it ever could be selective to just muscle. Yeah. And even then, if it is, um, there is a saturation point. It's just like saying, let's invent a new creatine. Once you're saturated in creatine, it doesn't matter what form you give, um, you're saturated. Like you're not going to super-duper-duper saturate. Um, so I think you run into that physiological limitation, I think especially with glucose disposal, the other problem is you have a large chance of it dropping you hypoglycemic and then you get rebound um, feeding. Um, and, and I think one of the biggest things that I've realized, um, especially working on cognitive products and kind of insulin and glucose flux, is how those influence neurotransmission. Um, so things like eating a meal um, that's rich in carbohydrates, that actually will tend to increase serotonin production long-term. Uh, that's why giving 5-HTP reduces selectively carbohydrate intake. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of fascinating when we don't even realize it, but we're using food as medication sometimes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and you'll see that. Some people are overeaters when they're sad or depressed. Some people starve themselves. And I think that's a reflection of neurophysiology um, happening. Uh, so anyway, um, it's never, unfortunately, it's never a simple answer. <laughs> There's so many things that affect one another. And I think glucose disposal agents are really interesting, but I think they're probably more interesting in our untested counterpoints, yeah. counterparts than they are in tested, uh, lifters. Fantastic. Yeah, I think that's the, the last question I'll throw at you for now, Ben. And uh, I want to say a massive thank you for you coming on. And I want to make sure people can find you, reach out to you. Um, where should they head? Uh, De novo Instagram. Um, my Instagram, just Ben Esbro. If people want to ask questions there, it's probably the best place. Uh, that's pretty much the only social platform I'm on. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd say either of those are probably the best spots because you can ultimately get in touch with me via other methods there. Um, but yeah, I'm always happy to do my best to help if I can. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ben. And thank you guys for listening. Thank you.